Good morning, everybody. We lost a little bit of time, so I'll have to go quick. This is uh, affectionately known as my James Bond case. Uh, we're going to put this aside for a little bit, and um, we're going to go through a couple of different things. Uh, so yes, I will get to um, what we now call the machine. And uh, for those of you who were here last year, um, I gave a presentation that, was, that probably looked very similar to a lot of what I'm going to talk about a little bit later, and also what I launched at Discover um, as the machine. But when I was here last year, while we gave you all the bits and pieces, we didn't really give you the full story and tell you that we were working on this thing. But before we get there, what I actually want to start with is another part of my job. For those of you who aren't familiar, I actually have a few different jobs at HP. Uh, one is I'm the CTO of the company. Uh, two, as, as mentioned, I run our advanced research labs. But I'm also responsible for um, our cloud business unit, as well as something we call NFV, or Network Function Virtualization. I should say, the, not we don't call it, the industry calls it um, NFV. And so the reason I want to kind of start with cloud is that um, it'll give you a bit of an intro as to what Helium Cloud is about. Um, the journey that our customers are on when it comes to getting to the cloud. And then when we talk about the machine and the technologies behind the machine, give you a sense as to where, um, where the cloud is going when we think about this very long term. So um, interestingly enough, when we really we think about the cloud, we think about this promise of the cloud. And this is this simple picture of what people are trying to get to. Right? The idea that you have a very simple architecture, very automated, very self-service, and there's a set of properties um, that people expect when they come to the cloud. So first thing is they want the cloud to auto-scale. Right? The idea that you need to plan for months, uh, weeks and months, in order to bring new users online, or if you launch a particular activity and the inbound, the influx of customers that come to your environment is significantly above what you're expecting, how do you auto scale and how do you deal with that? And uh, in traditional IT, this kind of scaling is very difficult to accomplish. But that's one of the promises of cloud is auto scaling and what people are looking for. The next thing is automatic repair. If something happens, you just basically, it continues to work. And by the, by the way, one of the fundamental things to understand about the cloud is resiliency moves from the responsibility of the infrastructure to the responsibility of the application. And the application makes absolutely no assumptions about the availability of the infrastructure underneath it and we'll actually show you how applications need to change in your environment in order to be able, in, in our customer's environment in order to be able to deal with that. The next thing is fault tolerance. So the idea that um, nothing ever goes away, as I said, the application takes care of making sure your service is always, always, always up. And then we get to some of the other things around the running of the environment to say, I really do need this integrated life cycle. The idea that I can start from the developers, I have access to all of the source code, and I make all of the changes, I make all of the builds, and all of that actually automatically propagates into a runtime environment. And how do you manage that whole integrated life cycle and then the other thing is, how do I do this in a unified way? And you'll learn about terms like DevOps, where we start combining the developer world and the operations world, and at the extreme, some even call it no ops, in order to be able to run the entire environment. And there's one other thing that our customers want. They want it cheap. <laughs> we don't like that part so much, but it's okay. But no, we all want it, that's what we want to cheap. So I just showed you something that looks pretty cool. But let's now look at what the reality of most IT environments look like today. This is actually a real picture from a real customer. We don't disclose who, for obvious reasons. Um, but the reality is if we went to most of our um, customers, 
and said, draw me a picture of how your IT environment looks today, you would likely get this kind of a picture. And our role, all of us here collectively, is to help our customers go from this kind of an environment, and the beauty here, you'll have Ramon Baez, our CIO, who'll come up a little bit later and talk to you about this from an HPIT perspective, but our job is to help our customers migrate from this world to the ideal world of auto scaling, auto repair, fault tolerance, integrated life cycle, and that is the promise of the cloud. So then we get to, there are various ways in which you can build the cloud. And as we were looking at our options on how we do this, and we've been at this for a while, you can always take some lessons from history. And you kind of do the, what did the web teach us about the power of open source? And you can see here from this chart that open source has actually dominated the internet as we got to today. And there is nothing that suggests that things will actually change from this, that open source has made such a significant impact in how we run our world, how we run our technology world, that we expect that this will continue. And so that has driven the idea that we want to bring open source into the cloud. And so here you can see some of the goods and some of the challenges associated with bringing the open source. So remember, people want it at a lower cost. And open source has a tendency to be able to reduce the overall costs. The idea of standards and avoiding lock-in, right? There are too many people who perceive to be held hostage, hostage by um, legacy proprietary license-driven organizations, and they don't want to repeat that, that part of it of their IT infrastructure, and so how do they avoid um, the vendor lock-in through the use of standards? And being able to move applications around much more easily and the flexibility that comes with that, but all of that goodness does come with some challenges, and those challenges are opportunities for all of us and this is how HP looks at this, to be able to bring the best of both worlds together. So how do we support an open source world and we bring this to the table? In most Linux environments today, when you get support from HP, we handle a huge number of calls associated with that. When there's a security event, for example, there was Heartbleed not too long ago, we had a whole team of people that was ready and there to go deal with that. And building out an ecosystem, and I'll talk about how OpenStack has built an ecosystem, integrating all of this together. Because what you'll see from OpenStack is, it is a collection of technologies. But when you want to deploy a cloud, you need to bring all of these technologies together. You need to integrate all of that. And that's another role that we play. And then part of the role that you can play is also then integrate that even further into the customer's environment. And so building your own OpenStack expertise for your customers is actually a really good thing. And we mature the environment with the enterprise capabilities that we have. So have a look at, so let's have a look a little bit, a simple view of OpenStack. There's actually um, over a dozen projects that make up OpenStack, but these are the main ones. So there is a compute project codenamed Nova, and this is the part of OpenStack that allows you to deliver virtual machines very, very quickly and do it dynamically and very flexibly. There is a storage component. There's actually a couple. One's called Swift. One's called Cinder. And in those, you get access to things like object storage or block storage. Again, in a very programmatic, automated way, you get access to those things. And then you have Neutron, which represents the networking stack. So as you're trying to build a virtualized network and you need to be able to control your own VLANs and your own IP addresses, et cetera, Neutron is the piece that allows you to do that. And obviously, you want to put all of these things together. So as you spin up a workload and you want to be able to do it dynamically, 
have being able to programmatically have access to say, hey, I need this many virtual machines connected to this amount of networking or this amount of bandwidth with this kind of SLA, and I need this amount of block storage or object storage available, you want to essentially do that in a click. And that's what bringing all of this environment together. And so these are the open source projects that form the core of OpenStack, as I said, there are more around management, um, security, and other things, but these are the core, and your applications then run on this environment. Now, OpenStack is not new, but it's not been around for that long of a period of time, and when I look at the momentum of this, it's actually pretty astonishing. Um, I was actually involved in the fairly early days of the Linux environment. I actually started uh, working on Linux probably in about 1998. And at that point, Linux was seven years old and nobody had ever really heard of Linux, right? I mean, I might be exaggerating a bit, but the general IT industry at that point was not very familiar with Linux and that was seven years. And here we are in let's call it five years and we have got a momentum uh, built around OpenStack that is actually mind-boggling. And, um, and so we hopped on this, as you can see here, founding member of uh, the OpenStack Foundation. Um, as, of the, as of today, we are the number one contributors or committers to OpenStack, or the number one in the review cycles as well. And so we have placed a huge bet on the momentum of OpenStack and open source clouds. So now what's required is to say, I've got this OpenStack environment, I've got the greatness of open source uh, that's available to me to deploy my environment. What are some of the things that enterprise customers are going to need to be able to deploy this in their environment, right? And the idea of saying, hey, Mr. Customer, you can go to OpenStack.org, you can download a whole bunch of source code, you can, you know, bring all that together, you can spend a few months trying to integrate all those pieces, deploy that into your environment, and hey, you know, that'll be a fun little ride. It's not actually a great appealing conversation. So we need to have an ability to install and deploy an OpenStack environment in a really easy way, and not only do that, but also support updates and the management of the environment as well. And um, you'll see here hybrid IT. So you might have also heard the term hybrid cloud. And how do you deliver that cloud experience where in some cases the workload is better positioned in a public cloud environment like the HP public cloud? And a lot of customers will want to do dev and test in that way because it's very easy to just use the flexibility of an open public cloud. But then when I want to deploy my actual application, I want to click and deploy that in my private world, in my private cloud. And then you might get to a point where a portion of your environment you want HP to manage for you. And so you uh, ask HP to do that. And then you might want to mix and match. So in other words, have things that live in a managed environment, in a private environment, a public environment, but you want to look, you want to make that look like it's one cloud what we call a virtual private cloud. And the point here is to support all of those environments. And that's what Helion OpenStack is all about. And we provide two editions of Helion OpenStack. One edition, which we call the community edition, is for those who want to have a pure open source environment. I want to basically have exactly what is at OpenStack.org, or very close to it, we call it tied to trunk. And I want to be able to leverage that world, bring that down, and that's all I want to use. I don't want to have any extensions, any add-ons, any management capabilities, any of those things. I don't want any of that. I just want to have this pure open source world. Developers might want to do that. ISVs might want to do that. Um, and people who want to stay tied to that trunk might want to do that. But usually we see that for proof of concepts. And that edition of Helion OpenStack is available to anyone for immediate download and it's available for um, free and it's all tied to pure open source trunk. And then the next edition, which is our commercial edition, 
All of the other things you saw in the previous slide about ease of update, management, um, upgrades, um, security notifications, all of those capabilities, um, high availability, the fault tolerance, et cetera, all of those things and bigger scale are part of our commercial edition. And that is also available and uh, we encourage you to start um, deploying and doing proof of concepts and getting your teams really smart about Helion OpenStack Community, Helion OpenStack Commercial Edition, um, and leverage all of that. So this is what happens when you put kind of all of the pieces together. You have HP infrastructure. Um, obviously, the best infrastructure, whether it's you know, from ProLiant to our Blades environments, and then build up the OpenStack cloud environment and then be, have a set of services that are available and deploy that in a private, public, or hosted environment. And so here are some examples, right? You might say, hey, I want everything behind my firewall. The public cloud is really interesting, but I want my data, my control, my firewall, and in fact, a significant number of customers will actually prefer this type of cloud deployment. For larger IT organizations, a lot of what we're seeing is they want to essentially be a service provider inside of their IT organization. So they deploy a private cloud, but all of their lines of businesses, all of their users, as they interact with it, they see a self-service environment, they have a console, and they actually use it as though it was a public cloud, but it's all within the firewall environment. The next part is have it hosted. So we'll run it for you if that's what you want. And again, you can mix and match these worlds. These are not mutually exclusive, and that's how you create virtual private clouds. And you might want to use the public cloud. In essence, you have nothing on-prem, and everything is delivered to you as a consume type of business model, where you pay only for what you use as you use it. And that environment, and you'll actually see that running a little bit, in a little bit. And so that's what HP Helion is all about, is delivering an OpenStack enterprise grade capability and delivering it to you in such a way that you can deploy it in whatever way makes most sense for the end customer and the fact that that changes over time and it changes depending on the workload and we're flexible to do that in whatever way the customer really wants. Now most times when I see cloud presentations and people talk about cloud, they actually stop at that previous slide, right? We've got a great runtime, we've got a great cloud, go off and conquer the world. You're done. Well, guess what, folks? The real power of cloud, when you really, 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 really get to cloud, you have actually changed your applications. You've actually changed your application environment. In fact, the term we use internally is scale up versus scale out clouds. It's not a perfect uh, description, but if what someone is doing is taking a traditional IT world, let's call it Oracle, SAP, et cetera, and you are virtualizing that and adding some automation, that is a fantastic thing. And that is a great thing and we want you to go do that. But that only takes you a portion of the journey through the cloud. When you wanna get all of the properties of cloud that I started with, where it's auto scaling and resilient and fault tolerant and auto repair and where the application runs no matter what happens, you actually have to take it to the next level and rethink your applications. And so now you have to think about the developer who wants to create a new class of applications. Obviously, mobility comes to mind. They don't want to have to care about, geez, do I need to handle 1,000 users, a million users, 5,000? Like, what do I need to do? You don't want them to worry about any of those things. How big's my database? Do I have it? Do I have enough data? Do I have enough storage? Do I have enough space? You don't want the developer to have to think about any of those things. 
And as there are changes that are made and, and new features are added to the environment, you want those to just roll into the environment and not have to go through a multi-month cycle and then we're gonna freeze the entire environment for the weekend, we're gonna take everything down, then we're gonna upgrade from 6.2 to 6.21, and then we're gonna basically bring all of the environment back up. That is not cloud, okay? The cloud world is a new feature that just showed up on your app and nothing else was visible, okay? And so you want all of those properties, and you, but you don't want the developer to have to program and concern themselves with every aspect of that. And so that's why we created the Helion development platform. And so this is where now you get advantage of the true cloud. And, and I, this is the part now, if I go to all the customers and they say, I really, really wanna go to the cloud, we have a tendency to talk about the, what the IaaS layer, the infrastructure as a service layer. And that's what I, the, the whole Helion OpenStack world is all about, is delivering infrastructure as a service. But if your customer is saying, I really want to go all the way, I want to go true cloud, and I want all of the benefits of cloud, I want a DevOps environment, I want that world, this is the conversation that you now need to have, is to develop your apps in a whole new way, retrain your developers how to write those apps so that they are leveraging this environment. And so you can see that. Just like we joined the OpenStack world and that open source world, we did the same thing here with Cloud Foundry. And Cloud Foundry is an open source environment known as a PaaS layer, a platform as a service. And we're adding all of the capabilities around that to also integrate it to our infrastructure as a service layer, which is our Helion OpenStack platform. And you'll see from here that the, the developer has a choice of languages, right? So they can still develop in Java. They can still develop in Python or Ruby or whatever their language of choice is. But they have access to all of these services that magically are just available. And they know that their app will automatically scale, that they'll be able to deploy um, in a matter of minutes and take advantage of all of the features of the infrastructure and not have to concern themselves with the specific of the, infra of the infrastructure underneath. So I'm gonna ask um, Josh in a minute here to come out and uh, tell you a little story about this uh, to do an actual demo of the Helion development platform in action. So Josh, why don't you come out here? There he is. Welcome, Josh. Um, Thanks, Just so you guys get a little bit of how you operate at Cloud Speeds, we made a change, uh, a little bit of a change in plan. And on Friday, last week, Friday, we decided to get Josh to come here and do uh, this demo. And he's here doing the demo, right? So that, what normally you would have thought of weeks and months of planning, et cetera, this went from poor Josh Friday, guess what you're doing on Tuesday? <laughs> Uh, fortunately, he has some family in town, so that was good. So I'm going to leave you with Josh for yep. about five or ten minutes yep. to go do a demo. Enjoy the ride. I'll be right back. So All hi, right, everyone. Josh. Thanks, Martin. Uh, good morning. Happy to be here. I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about uh, what we're doing at HP. I work up in the Seattle office uh, on the Helium development platform that Martin was mentioning. Uh, and what we're focusing on is really the ability for application developers and IT operations teams to work together uh, to build, deploy, and manage their applications more quickly on top of that OpenStack layer that, that Martin mentioned. So we're going to go through a few scenarios. This is a live environment, so uh, you know, anything can happen. I, I hope the network connectivity is looking all right. We're going to pivot to this is the dashboard that a developer sees when they log into the development platform for the first time. Uh, so one of the interesting things of the platform is the concept of a, a reference app store. And as a developer, I'm going to put on my developer hat here. My IT operations team has stood up this environment. Uh, they give me credentials. Uh, so I'm going to go in and, and do uh, a simple application deployment. So we have this concept of a reference application store. And so this is running on top of OpenStack. This is the development platform. And as an enterprise, you can add your own applications here. Uh, the platform comes uh, pre-shipped with a bunch of open source applications. So we'll go ahead and deploy an application just as an example here. 
let's find WordPress at the very bottom. So you can see I've got a few basic options. Uh, I didn't have to SSH in the server, pull down a bunch of packages. Uh, we're going to ac accept the defaults here and say start application and deploy. And immediately we should see that the platform is sensing, it's, it's looking at the source code uh, of the application I just deployed, uh, picking up all the dependencies. Uh, I've worked in enterprise IT before. Uh, I've been a developer working with uh, IT operations teams before. And this traditionally may result in me having to create a bunch of tickets, coming up with a uh, you know, design proposal, and if it was a big application, wait for some hardware. Uh, so this application will be deployed for me in less than a minute. And this is the live log stream of the actual build process happening for all the dependencies as part of that application. While it's deploying, we'll pivot over to maybe, as a developer, one of the more interesting parts of the platform. Uh, this is where you can scale your application. So there are two types of scaling. Uh, I can set these uh, characteristics for my application in my actual source code if I'm deploying a custom app, or I can just do it from the console here. So for demos, the console is really nice. For developers, they're probably going to use you know, a config file or the command line. Uh, so there are two types of scaling. One is just pivoting this switch to on. And if we pivot it to on, It'll just mean it scales by CPU. So if uh, there's a bunch of uh, traffic to my application, it'll automatically scale out. And then if the uh, traffic dies, it'll scale back in. The other way of scaling is manually. So we can move the slider to the right. And if we move it to the right, uh, the instances for the application will increase up to the level that I specify. So you can see the application just went live. It's running. Uh, it's in a running state. We'll say, just for an example, that we're doing a product launch. And our product launch, we know, is going to have traffic right at the gate. Uh, so our product blog is going to need to scale up uh, to handle all that traffic. So we just moved the slider to 10 instances. We should see, if we scroll down here, that nine new instances of our application were added to the environment. And they started as starting state, and then they flipped to a running state. So in just about 10 seconds, we scaled our application, which we'll, we'll visit in a second to make sure it's working, uh, into a, a production pool uh, with traffic being routed to each of these containers uh, in parallel. So let's make sure the application's running, and then we'll, we'll dive a little bit deeper. So this is the, uh, the default WordPress blog. Those 10 application instances that we saw flip to a running state, uh, those are all being routed through this DNS address. So another example of, you know, in the traditional world, as a developer, if I wanted to deploy this to production, I probably would have to create a DNS ticket if there's not an API for my internal uh, DNS service. Uh, the development platform is taking care of all this routing and load balancing for you automatically. So when you're done with uh, an application or you want to free up a resource, uh, it's very easy to deprovision something from the platform. So we'll go ahead and say stop application. And then we'll say delete the dependent services. So these are databases that were provisioned uh, for me automatically. And then that's as simple as it is. So we just freed up that, that application that we just deployed, scaled out to 10 instances, uh, mapped into a load balancer DNS uh, configuration, and then unmapped it. So that's interesting. Uh, but most of the time, you're not deploying a pre-canned application. Usually, it's an you know, internal app that's maybe integrating with a legacy system. Or it may just be a cloud native app, uh, something brand new that a developer is prototyping. So let's take a look at how that scenario might work. I've got a, a local environment set up here. So I've got a Python application. Uh, this is actually just a healthcare application uh, that we wrote quickly. It's uh, formatted to work well on a mobile device, and it does patient scheduling against a, a, a legacy backend system. Uh, so take, take note of the version here. It's version 1.5. We're going to deploy a new version of our application. Our development teams made some optimizations to our code. Uh, all that code's running in this local environment, and we want to push it out to a, a sandbox or a test environment for our QA team to take a look. So from my editor, we can say git commit directory. And this, all this is doing is pushing uh, my local code to my source code management system. And we should see in just a second that the push was successful. So that means my source code management system just got updated. Uh, we can actually look at what's happening behind the scenes. So I have a tool here called Jenkins. Jenkins is an open source project. Uh, and Jenkins manages all the builds from my application. So the nice thing is the development platform integrates with these uh, open source build management systems. They can integrate with proprietary build management systems. Uh, it's all scripted via command line, so it's very extensible. So we can see that commit that I just made with my new version of my app was pushed. It's going through a build process. We can actually see that build process happening in real time right now. 
And at the very end of the build script, it gives you the URL of where your application was just deployed. Uh, so you might imagine there's a sandbox for developers that can freely deploy and test applications. And then there may be a separate environment where the operations team is handling the deployments, and they're the ones with access to the, the build files and the actual production URLs. So let's take a look at this application that we just deployed. We can see the version is, is 1.6 now. It's the new version of our application. So it just detected all the dependencies for that app, spun up all the infrastructure. As a developer, I didn't have to log into any instances, talk to anyone. It was all in this short feedback loop, uh, which is really fast for a, an internal development cycle. So we'll just confirm our application's working, and it looks like it is. So that's great. So let's go back to the platform and view our running applications. So what happens now? We've got an old version of the application and a new version. Martin talked about uh, the ability to do seamless updates uh, for a cloud application. Uh, this is a, where the, the platform comes in handy. So we've got this scenario where we've got two versions of an application. We're going to get pretty geeky here because developers love command lines. And uh, a lot of the good functionality in the platform is uh, through the command line client. So we're, just like we did in the console, we're going to list the applications that we have. And we should see the two apps. So we've got the old version of the app and the new version. If you look closely here, the old version is the one that's getting production traffic, the scheduler.acmehealthco. Uh, the other URLs with the build numbers here, those are just dependent so we can keep track of uh, the different applications as they're getting redeployed and redeployed in the environment. So as an ops guy, what I'd probably want to do here is, assuming QA has checked out this application and we're ready to release it, we can map this new version of the application into the pool and it can start receiving traffic. We can do this all via a simple command line call, and it takes about a second. So let's go ahead and add it to the production URL. Let's make sure it's the right application. App scheduler. OK. So that map call is actually what's doing this attachment to a load balancer and updating the DNS record. So it says successful. We can relist the applications in the environment. And now we see that both are healthy. Uh, they're both running. And they both have this production URL. Uh, so that's pretty powerful because it's a very tight loop from load balancer DNS application deployed. And if we wanted to, we could extend this further. If the new version of the app was healthy and you know, all the, the monitoring vitals checked out, we could on map the old version of the application. So we'll go ahead and go back to the console here. Uh, all this code that I showed, this framework, this platform that runs on top of OpenStack, this is available for download today from our website for free. Uh, you can go to the Helium Development Platform landing page, uh, download the preview, uh, give us feedback. We'd love to hear your, your thoughts, questions. And there's a community forum that we've built uh, along with a developer network that provides bindings, uh, tutorials, and example applications. So with that, I think we'll pass it back to Martin. And uh, thanks for your time. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. Josh Berry, folks, um, as you can see, that's, uh, that's pretty powerful. And uh, what Josh just kind of demoed for you in a traditional IT world would probably take months. Like literally what you saw in minutes um, would likely take months. And so when you're talking to your customers about, I want to go to cloud, and you talk about the cloud journey, it's important for you to be able to articulate and understand where your customer is today and how far along that cloud journey do they want to go and do they want to take that final step to be able to have this kind of application uh, capability, flexibility uh, in their environment and, uh, and guide them to get there. The other thing that also makes up um, Helion is something we announced at Discover called the Helion Network. The idea behind the Helion network was actually fairly simple, which is just like we use the open, we work with the open source community to be able to leverage the innovation and the power of thousands of developers on top of the uh, of all of those HP provides. The Helion network allows us to have a global footprint, allows all of you to have a global footprint for infrastructure and. Um, platform as a service capabilities. 
And so we're, st we're still in the process of establishing the network. We've got a, a few charter members already on board. And what will happen now is that if you have someone who develops an app using the Helion developer platform, or if they just use the Helion OpenStack infrastructure as a service, they can actually have the ability for that application to live across um, all of the members of the Helion network and have global footprint almost instantaneously. And so for those who, for example, say, hey, our public cloud is not as big as so-and-so's public cloud, well, guess what, folks? Our public cloud just became global and huge very, very rapidly, and you have the ability to leverage the Helion network. So as I mentioned, the cloud is a journey. And as you talk to your customers, as we talk to our customers, as I said, we have to help them along that journey from getting to that really, really ugly picture I showed to standardize and consolidate that environment, go to that virtualization stage. And just, th this is not, like I said, it's not a bad thing, but there are a significant number of people that when they get to virtualize and automate, they think they're done. They think they're cloud. And if that's where they want to go and that's a good definition, then just, that's okay. But as we get the lingo kind of all figured out, we want to make sure that people understand there are more steps to get to that full journey of the cloud and do they want to leverage all of those capabilities there. So now let's transition to um, the machine. And even with all of this wonderful cloud stuff, the thing is we as an industry are still dealing with a massive, massive onslaught of data that will continue and we see no abatement. And this magnitude of data is essentially reaching a point where we do not have the infrastructure that can actually scale. And we can continue to try and build very large data centers with very large clouds, but the reality is that we are going to reach a scale wall as an industry. And we do the math, and every time we do the math, we see we hit a scale wall. And so it's, we were thinking through, well, what do we need to go do next? The primary components in our systems that will actually cause that scale wall to occur are DRAM and flash. DRAM comes first, flash is next. So notice I'm very careful here, because I want to be very clear about this. I do not ever suggest that we're going to wake up one day and DRAM and flash are going to stop working. Okay? It's just not going to happen. Right? What will happen, though, is our expectation that every year or every 18 months, the servers we buy have double the amount of RAM for the same price or cheaper, that is going to stop. We will be unable to scale DRAM and flash the way we need to to continue. So the other part that we looked at that was sort of interesting, it was sort of an interesting aha moment, is we think of the IT industry as being innovative and always changing. And it's really interesting if you just kind of think about this and just take a step back. All computers today, whether they are a phone, a tablet, a, main, a mainframe, a server, it doesn't matter. They kind of haven't changed in 50 years. CPU, memory, I.O., or storage. And we, as an industry, as virtualization came online, we decided to create a software version of this. So again, we created the same thing. And the core of the machine is about fundamentally changing that concept using a new set of technologies. So one part that will continue to exist is the actual central processing unit, right? The actual brains of the computer. And we will continue to use electrons to process that. However, we think that communications, even inside the server, the phone, the tablet, the computer, will over time evolve to become a photonics link, or actually communicating between components using light instead of electrons. And for storage, we believe that ions are going to take the role of being able to store information 
and doing at extreme scale and very high performance. Okay, so we think about the scale, and so the reason why we wanted to show you this was because most of the time when I talk about the machine, and most people, and for example, in your jobs, we think about the machine, we think about it more in the context of a server, and then we think about the rack, and then we think about the data center, right? And so the machine is typically thought of as the very large. But I want to make the point, here I get to the James Bond case, that um, the machine can also be just this. So when you think of a phone, think of the machine. Think of something that has processing, but now 100 terabytes of storage in your pocket operating at very low power. And what could you do with that? So I just want to make the point that the reason it's called the machine is because we didn't want to call it a server or a tablet or a phone or a PC or any of those things. We essentially just wanted to call it something generic. And actually, truth be told, I did that in a meeting room and I said, we'll just call it that until somebody comes up with a better name and well, here we are. So um, that's what happens when you don't have a marketing department, right? Um, and so that's, you know, I just want you to make sure you, when you think about the machine, we think about it in different steps. I also want to basically also connect this to today, right? When we work with our product teams in the organization, this is not a, I sit in one, you know, building one place and I think about, let me tell you what's going to happen in 10, 15, 20 years. And then a bunch of the product business units go, hey, we're just going to do some products and we don't actually talk. That's actually not what happens. Right? Um, we actually do sit in the same room a lot of times, and we think about this in both contexts. And the job that we try to do, and it's a very, very difficult balance. This is a very non, this is a non-trivial thing to do, is how do we build products today with technology that's available today? How do we innovate using today's world while at the same time laying track for the technologies that we hope will come available in the future. And Moonshot is a good example of that, where we started to lay track with low power using SOCs um, and building a different class of machine. For those of you who haven't seen, Moonshot is a chassis that is uh, able to hold uh, 45 cartridges. Here is a Moonshot cartridge with four processors. Right, so if you think of your typical big rack server and you look at a four socket server, you'll actually have something that's, you know, I think it's uh, four to six U high, um, fairly deep, et cetera. And here in one cartridge, we have four CPUs, we have DRAM on the other side, and then you have 45 of these in one Moonshot chassis. Um, so we lay track for um, getting ready for something like the machine. So I talked about photonics, and so photonics is very interesting to us for a couple of reasons. One is part of the reason why our current data centers will have a challenge is energy consumption. So we have this massive onslaught of data coming in. And then not only do we need to process all of that data, the energy required to do that is reaching unbelievable proportions. And so a big part of why we're doing what we're doing, and I'll talk in a minute about um, the storage and memory hierarchy, is around photonics is we need to have a technology that allows us to transmit data at extreme speeds, but do it at extreme low power. In essence, use almost no energy. And what most people don't realize is, you know, most of you in your offices or elsewhere, you might have like an RJ45 cable that goes in the back of your laptop, you click it in and you're kind of good to go. Right? Well, when you want to basically now have data center scale and you want to start processing petabytes of data, the cables that you need start getting a little bit out of hand. So as a demonstration, I have a collection. This is just a bundle of RJ45 cables. And this bundle here like this would probably handle about 300 terab terabytes of, excuse me, 300 gigabits of information um, piping through here and it would use an incredible amount of energy to push all of those electrons through all of these wires. So the reason we like photonics is rather than have 300 gigabits, 
how would you like to have six terabits on a piece of fiber? Okay. That's why we like this. And we can do this using almost no energy. And so that's why we're putting so much energy around photonics. There will be an evolution here. The first version of the machine will likely um, still have an electron, electronic-based system. Then we'll get to um, a first generation of photonics called Vixels, and then eventually get to a next generation of photonics called Silicon Photonics. And, um, but we're very excited about the opportunity to really change the architecture of how we build systems to do that. So here now is probably the most critical part of the machine. Today we have, and what we've been building since the 1950s, is essentially a storage hierarchy. We go from SRAM and on-chip, on-CPU caches, all the way through to um, caches and storage and the actual rotating media, or flash. And that hierarchy can be anywhere from nine to 11 levels deep. And we call this actually the volatility chain and the amount of billions or the, the amount of code that has been written over decades to manage the volatility chain is extreme. So what the machine really is about at its core is collapsing the storage memory hierarchy so that storage and memory converge into a single entity we call universal memory. So it's kind of interesting when we launched the machine at Discover, most of the feedback from customers, from the press, from analysts was all just unbelievably positive. And, uh, and that, you know, we were pretty excited about that. Now, as expected, you know, it's the job of our competitors to sort of poke holes at us. And um, Dell didn't miss the opportunity. The great innovator. Um, <laughs> telling us about our innovations. Um, so, but the interesting thing was in there, I could actually tell why they didn't get it. Because here's where they went. They said, because we talked about Memristor, which is the technology we want to use for universal memory, and their comment was, HP's wrong, phase change memory will come first. And that was my clue. They don't understand what we're doing. Here's why. The statement was actually a true statement. It's very, very likely true. But phase change, which is an alternative, there's three alternatives. There's resistive memory, which is memristor, phase change, which is another one, and the other one's called spin transfer torque. Phase change is only viable as a flash replacement. It does not have the properties that we need to also be a DRAM replacement. And so this is the point. If what you see is alternative technologies to say, I'm going to take out my flash SSD, and I'm going to replace it with a different kind of SSD, in this case, phase change, but I'm going to leave the computing architecture all the same, that's fine. That is not the machine. When you collapse the storage memory hierarchy so that you no longer need to have this shuffling of information back and forth between memory and storage, which is where we actually spend 80% of our compute cycles is shuffling data back and forth between memory and storage, that is the machine. And so that was the clue, and, but it was also helpful because it also helped me understand that we need to continue to drive that point home. We, as a result, put a blog post in um, where we explain the concept of universal memory because it will fundamentally change things. We also talked about a brand new operating system. And the reason why creating a new operating system is interesting here is because whether it's Windows or Linux or any of the current operating systems, they spend 80% of their time paging things in and out of disk from disk to memory. And if you don't have to do that anymore, you change the character of what an operating system is. And we also saw the opportunity to actually build something where security is a first-class citizen designed right in from the beginning. So that's how you put all the pieces together. You have that fundamental infrastructure of Memristor, Photonics, and si systems on a chip, which we introduced with Moonshot. With Memristor, which I, for those, some people like to see this, this is a uh, Memristor wafer. Um, we're working with a fab partner called SK Hynix. And um, this is uh, one of the Memristor wafers that they 
uh, shipped back to us as we're working on the lab to fab transfer, which is very complex, um, in order to, to build this. And um, the other point also to make here is that, um, for example, recently, um, and this is just like Moonshot, our three-part team launched the all-flash array, right? All the dots connect, right? Because we know where this world is going, all of the work that our three-part team is doing around the flash array, how do you manage data, how do you manage that world, all of the data hierarchy, data aging, uh, deduplication, all of those things are all critical to even a machine with 160 petabytes of main memory or 160 petabytes of universal memory, to be more precise. You need to have all of that. And so we connect the dots. So working with your customers on 3PAR is also very important. And then we get to um, all of the layers on top. After we've built the operating system, we also have a team that is working on a new set, set of algorithms to be able to run applications. Here was the interesting thing as we went through and said, what happens and what's the right workload for a system that has 160 petabytes of universal memory byte addressable in under 250 nanoseconds. What do you do with that? And when we started looking at and analyzing, what we discovered was that a significant number of problems became graph analytics problems, right? So my favorite example is imagine a large airline, we'll just we'll pick United, right? And imagine now being able to keep your entire fleet of aircraft, all of your pilots, all of your flight attendants, every seat available, every baggage handler, every piece of baggage, every airport, every gate, all in memory, all available in real time. And any event occurs, whether it's a mechanical on one aircraft, whether it's a weather event, anything at all, you now have the ability to optimize that graph for any outcome you choose increased revenue, less customer impact, and so on and so forth. So it's an example of unsolved problems today for which having these very large in-memory systems allow you to solve. And we've noticed that the vast majority of our, uh, of our workloads essentially turn into, even though they are not today, basically large graph analytics problems. So spend some time tonight on Google researching graph analytics and. It's fun reading, trust me. Um, <laughs> so we do some modeling around performance. So you can see what do you do in a graph analytics problem when you can analyze um, 16 trillion edges uh, per second. And so you can see that from a performance perspective, uh, we're there. But we'll look at the um, dramatic difference in power utilization and the size of the problem. So we can maintain equivalent performance, have a 4x larger problem at substantially less energy uh, available. And so this is why uh, we are working on the machine. All right, so I'm going to go through quickly here because we, we did kind of run short of time on sort of what happens to the cloud in the future when you have all of this capability. And you can see this is how we think about the cloud is uh, being a central intelligence uh, view where we can now have a learning engine. And what we, our goal is to say, put a machine everywhere. So take a machine and have a machine on every aircraft. Have a machine on every cell tower. Have a machine everywhere and do an amazing amount of local processing. And then transfer only the index to the central source and then use the index to provide intelligence to all of the other parts of the mesh. And this is how we think about the cloud for the future. Let's give Martin a big hand, everybody.